Hello and welcome to Module 5.2, Assisted GPS Acquisition Search Space. So what we're going to do in this video is combine the concepts that we looked at in the previous video of Assisted GPS with the Acquisition Search Space that we looked at in Module 4. So you'll recall from the last video that we saw with Assisted GPS we can reduce the search space. And you'll recall from Module 4 that we looked at the search space and we worked out how big it was in terms of the contributors. Satellite motion gave us plus or minus 4.2 kilohertz on this frequency axis here. And the effect of the TCXO was 1 for 1 in terms of PPM and 1.575 kilohertz per PPM. And then the receiver speed was by far smaller than these other contributors. You saw 0.146 kilohertz for each 100 kilometer per hour of receiver speed. So we, we looked at that for regular GPS. Now, when we have assisted GPS, we're going to look at if you limit the search space to just searching between the lines, then what are the main contributors? And that's what we're going to look at in this video, how we get all of these different values here for TCXO, receiver speed, initial position, and initial time. Uh, remember that the way we get assisted GPS is by having an initial position. And so that's, that's why we have to take note of this and having an initial time and then working out what we expect the Doppler of the satellite to be. And so that expected Doppler is going to be a function of the initial position and initial time and, and how much of a function it is and how large a search space we have to search. So now we're just, instead of searching the whole area, we're just searching between the lines. Well, how far apart should those lines be? That's what we're looking at today. So we're now going to look at these first two terms uh, the effect of the TCXO and the effect of receiver speed. Now, we already looked at receiver speed in Module 4, and you'll remember we had this value of 146 hertz for every 100 kilometer per hour that the receiver is moving, and now we have this two times factor. So where does this come from? Well, we'll see uh, in the next slide. So, so we saw before that uh, we talked about how the oscillator in a receiver might have an offset of something like one part per million. However, whatever the oscillator offset in the receiver is, when that receiver is part of a cell phone and the cell phone's communicating with a cell tower, then the cell phone can calibrate that oscillator to whatever accuracy the cell tower was calibrated to. And turns out that cell towers are calibrated to plus or minus 100 ppb or part per billion of frequency. And therefore, your GPS receiver oscillator can be calibrated and is calibrated to the same accuracy. And so that's where we get the 100 ppb as a typical value for the calibration of the oscillator. Now in module four, we already looked at the effect on satellite Doppler of a moving vehicle. But if you're calibrating your oscillator from a cell tower, the moving vehicle also in gets an error from the cell tower. And so the effect of the speed of the vehicle on the observed Dopplers that we have to search will now include a factor of two because the speed of the vehicle affects the Doppler of the satellite and it affects the Doppler of the signal with which we're calibrating our local oscillator inside the receiver. And that's why we get this factor of two on the previous slide and as shown here. So, so, now, so it, in, in every case except for this one, the presence of assistance reduces the search frequency, but, but th this particular part of the error, the, the error in frequency with respect to speed, actually gets a factor of two. And you, you see now why we use this 100 ppb, so we expect plus or minus 100 ppb just from the TCXO itself. Okay, so we've taken care of the first two terms. Now what about this next term, the error with respect to the initial position of the receiver? So we, we get a position from a cell tower and that will be the position of the cell tower itself. And we won't actually be at that position. We'll be somewhere nearby, maybe a few kilometers away. And so when we work out what the expected Doppler was at the cell tower's location, how much error is that with respect to our position? You, you'll see the answer there. We say it's three hertz for three kilometers. Uh, three kilometers is typically the distance that you 
would can receive a cell tower signal up to before you get handed over to another cell tower. So you'll so we often use three kilometers, and we assert here that the error is three hertz for three kilometers. Where does that come from? That's what we'll look at in the next slide. So let's begin with a true position where we know we actually are, and it's somewhere up here in the northwestern part of the United States. And now to make Instead of showing three kilometers on this scale, I'm going to show you a few thousand kilometers to make things clear. And we'll work out what the error on the observed Doppler is as the position of the observer moves. So we'll, we'll stick with our true position, shown up here. And we'll say, imagine that the assumed position is down here. Now, what's the difference between the true Doppler that you would see at the true position and the estimated Doppler that you would see at the assumed position, which is at the edge of this vector delta x? Well, the answer is it depends on where the satellite is. If the satellite were in line with this delta x, suppose we had a satellite down here, then the observed Doppler is the same whether you're at the beginning of that delta x or the end of the delta x, because the Doppler is just the velocity of the satellite dot product the line of sight vector uh, from the user or, or to the user. And so the Doppler of, of this fictitious satellite would be the same whether we're at the beginning of this line or at the end of this line. So what, what is the worst case? Well, the worst case occurs when the satellite is approximately 90 degrees to the position error. And in fact, when the, the satellite forms an isosceles triangle so that you have the same angle here as here, and that angle will be almost 90 degrees because the satellite's much further away typically than this delta x, particularly when the delta x is a number like three kilometers. And we're just showing it much bigger here for exposition. So when, that, when that's the case, then you get the, the worst case error. This alpha shown here will be approximately 90 degrees. And the satellite will be out here. And the estimated Doppler would be the velocity of the satellite. This would be this vector v dot product, this e estimate would be the negative of that. And the, the true Doppler will be v dot product e true. And so we can write an equation relating those two together. And the first thing we can do is express the Doppler error in terms of the difference between E true and E estimate, just by writing V dot E minus V dot E like that. And, and now if we look at E true minus E estimate, you'll see it's this small little arrow there. And we can express that vector as a in terms of our uh, delta x, our position error, because it, it, we just have similar triangles here. And so this delta x is this delta, delta E shown here we're, that we're pointing at here with this arrow, that delta E is just this vector, delta x, divided by the range to the satellite but by the property of similar triangles. The big triangle here is similar to the little triangle there. And so this E true minus E estimate can be replaced by delta x divided by range. And so we get this equation as a function of the delta x. And now we just have to put in the values. Uh, so v dot delta x is the m magnitude of v, which is satellite speed, times the magnitude of delta x, shown here, times cosine of the angle between them. So it's, the cosine is always less than 1. So we can, that's where we get this less than or equal to there. So we have an upper bound here, and then divide by the range as the previous line. And now you'll, rem you'll remember from a previous video that the satellite speed in Earth's and Earth fixed coordinates is bounded by 3.3 kilometers per second. And then and the range of the satellite is about 20,000 kilometers. That's that term there. If we multiply this all out, we get this number, 0.17 times 10 to the minus 3. And we choose to put an upper bound on that of 0.19 times 10 to the minus 3. So why do we do that? Well, remember that 19 centimeters is the wavelength of the satellite. So if we analyze this like this, suppose delta x is one kilometer. Then one kilometer times 10 to the minus 3 is going to be one meter. And 
so and we we left with 0.19 meters per second. So for each kilometer of delta x value, we get one wavelength per second. In other words, one hertz. So we can rewrite this as one hertz per kilometer. And that's the result we're looking for. So that's the effect of the error in assumed position on the expected Doppler. Now what about the assumed time? So how do you analyze that? Well, the way we choose to analyze that is by doing simulations uh, of the observed Doppler from certain points on the Earth and in watching how fast the Doppler changes with time. And then we can see the time effect on the Doppler frequency. And so what we do is we choose to start at the North Pole and we, we do a simulation where somebody's standing on the North Pole and watching a satellite. And so, so I'll explain this top plot. So here we have time in hours going up to 24. This is a 24 hour scale here. And we're observing the Doppler rate. How fast does the Doppler change in hertz per second? And what you see is these are all the different satellites in view. And there's a very well behaved pattern here. Every single one starts off with a slight negative Doppler rate that gets larger negative and then comes back again. And the reason for that is if you're standing on the North Pole, the Earth's spinning around beneath you. you you're not actually moving through space. You're just rotating on the axis of the Earth. And so remember, we talked about how when the satellite's rising, it's getting closer to you. And as it reaches zenith, it's as close as it's going to get. And then it's getting further from you. So the Doppler rate of the satellites starts off at a certain value and reaches a maximum and then and then is symmetric the other way around. And it's all everything symmetric at the North Pole. Now, if you move away from the North Pole, you move down towards the equator, things get more complicated because now you're standing on a different part of the Earth and you're spinning underneath the satellite. So at a certain stage, you'll start to catch up with the satellite orbit or maybe pull away from it. And you'll see that some of the lines over here, so this is at latitude 37 degrees, for example, San Jose, California is at that latitude. Um, and so you'll see some, some of these lines look well behaved depending on where the satellite is in the sky, but some of them have a more complicated behavior as you catch up with the satellite. So we, we generate these plots for different points, the North Pole, a certain latitude, the equator, and then we just observe what's the maximum value of the Doppler rate across the whole Earth. And what we'll see is that the maximum value is 0.8 of a hertz per second, the maximum magnitude of the Doppler rate. And so we do that whole exercise just to come up with that number, 0.8 of a hertz per second, the maximum rate of the Doppler. And then we know that if your time were off by plus or minus two seconds, then you'd have 1.6 hertz contribution of error from that time error. And so that's where we get this value here, 1.6 hertz for two seconds of initial time error, because two seconds is typically what a cell tower is calibrated to. So these values here, these 100 ppb, we explained 100 kilometer per hour is just a nominal value we can scale. The three kilometer, we explained where that comes from. And so now here are all our contributors for this reduced search space that we're going to search for assisted GPS. And, and that's the end of this video. But before we, we finish, just notice something, how different these things are from what we had when we didn't have assisted GPS. When we didn't have assisted GPS, we had the, this range out to 4.2 kilohertz, 4.2 kilohertz. That range was dominated by the satellite orbit itself. Now with assisted GPS, you work out the orbit in advance. And you'll see that, first of all, there's nothing in kilohertz here. It's all in hertz. And the, and the dominant error now is the, the receiver speed and the TCXO offset. So they, they become much more important. And, and you'll see that in the next video.